Hi there, this is Elise Bernal, the Executive Director of the Vermont Symphony Orchestra, and I am joined by conductor Sarah Ioannidis, who will be conducting our September 17th, 2022 concert at the Flynn. Welcome, Sarah. Hello, Elise. This is uh, not your first time to Burlington, and I'd love to just sort of jump in on the very sort of international life that I think I've just learned more about today. Born in Australia, moved overseas, somehow ended up here. Just walk us through how that how you ended up in the States. Well, um, yeah, it's some of it's beyond my control, of course. Uh, I, I moved when I was very young from Australia to England. Um, born there because my father was working as a, a postdoctoral research scientist before he went then into music later on. So then I lived in England till I was about uh, in my early 20s and I came to the US to study um, at the Curtis Institute of Music on a Fulbright scholarship and then um, moved throughout the United States and I've lived in Philadelphia and um, New York Cincinnati, Spartanburg, South Carolina, Connecticut, and uh, El Paso, Cincinnati, and Tacoma. So a lot of different places. <laughs> Goodness, you've been all over the place. I actually, I met you uh, just over a year ago when you came with your family to come see our Summer Under the Stars Chamber Orchestra concert in Shelburne. Uh, and I believe that through your husband, you have a connection to New England Am I right to, to Vermont, or is it just, or is it uh, Connecticut? Just yeah, that? no, we we have a lot of uh, connections to Vermont. But my husband works uh, right now at Yale University. He teaches the trombone there, um, and he's been many times to Vermont when he played with the Empire Brass and uh, has met mouthpiece makers. And I myself have been here for both vacationing and. Um, and visiting work reasons. So uh, a lot of friends in Vermont. Oh, Hope they come to the concert. <laughs> and I think when we were talking earlier today, you were a skier, maybe not so much anymore, but you certainly appreciate um, some of the wonderful things that we have to offer here in Vermont, uh, off the stage. Yes, and I hope to be a skier again. In fact, this might be my big year to get back to it. But yeah, don't totally love um, the beautiful hills and the green of Vermont, who, who wouldn't, but yes, I do for sure, Great. like outdoor life. Well, speaking of, of, of a busy year, um, all anyone has to do is look at your website and wonder how you pack it all in. You, you've you been recently been conducting in South Korea, um, Dallas is coming up, Roanoke, of course, Tacoma. Why don't you just share with us a little bit about what your year looks like as a conductor? Well, actually, Dallas, I'm just going to point that out, is I'm, I'm speaking at, so I am going there, and it's a part of a win, Women in Music Symposium, um, but later I will be conducting in uh, Sarasota and Quebec um, in Philadelphia with Curtis Institute of Music, um, and yes, it's it's a quite a busy year. I'm very excited about it. Um, how do we how do we pack it in? Well, um, a lot of juggling of back and forth travel with my husband um, and myself living in Tacoma. Um, the, my, my main um, affiliation is Symphony Tacoma, where I am music director, and that's my ninth season. Um, and of course, we have many wonderful concerts there as well. So, yeah, um, it requires an immense amount of planning, as you will know very well. Um, Pre-organization of everything from... I mean, we're talking about one to two plus years in advance of repertoire, details, planning, collaborations, um, flights and hotels is the kind of the easy part. <laughs> but uh, and and then really just staying focused. Um, it's it's almost like a preventative medicine <laughs> that that uh, you have to sort of think about everything that could could go wrong and avoid it. And so that means really trying to stay healthy, um, planning wisely, uh, repertoire and all sorts of stuff like that. Well, speaking of repertoire, we've got Saturday coming up. I am very excited about this. This has been many years in the planning. Many, I, I think I didn't realize it's been perhaps four years almost 
um, especially around Daniel Bernard Remain's commissioned piece that we've co-commissioned with the UVM Lane series and the Flynn titled Riots and Prayers, um, a, a wonderfully unique, unusual piece of music. Tell us a little bit about how that started with you. What, where did that come from? You and Daniel Bernard remain in this piece and, and, and give us some hints about what, what we might expect. Well, um, actually, that was the one part of the program that was pre-organized. And I am just absolutely thrilled that I'm the one um, to to kind of give birth to it. And, and it's in, it's a, kind of like a baby in my hands waiting to happen. But so many people have contributed to this idea, I think, including the Flint Center and Daniel and your predecessor. And, uh, and so the rest of the program was more part of my uh, sort of artistic planning. Um, but But this is really an exciting piece because... And I think it's more topical and relevant than it probably was when we were originally going to do it two and a half years ago. You know, it's it's really about uh, the opportunity for anybody to come forward and say what's on their mind and what's important to them, say a prayer, say how they feel. And so we have these four plus incredible um, partners coming from the audience, maybe from the wings, um, and they have free reign on what they are going to be talking about and what they're going to say. The orchestra will continue to play the music um, in the background. And there's sort of very um, beautiful music in the background that kind of weaves the story and, and perhaps provokes in a little way some kind of call and responses from these speakers who, who don't just speak once, but, but twice um, from the audience and, and wherever they're going to be, which will represent some really um, diverse ways of thinking and um, who knows they might they might chant they might say poetry they might give a recitation they may just say something that's on their mind so truly excited about a very extraordinary way of presenting classical music with people's independent thoughts this absolutely brilliant idea of Daniel's it's uh it makes me think of you, you take a concerto, which is, is, is difficult enough to balance, you know, the orchestral response to the soloist playing, but that's known, um, not how they're going to interpret it, but at least the score is known. This is so different because we do not know, we have no control over what these people will be saying um, and how to balance that literal voice um, that it can be heard in the amount of time and what they're going to say with a score is indeed incredibly unique. Um, I'd love to hear a little bit. So if that was a piece that was given to you as a fait accompli and, and around that you chose two very, very different pieces of music, um, uh, Gershwin and Prokofiev. So talk a little bit about the Gershwin first. How did you choose that? Well, um, I think I wanted to find something that would um, excite and be of a style and an ilk that, that um, sort of sets the stage, you know, a hundred so, so years ago, but in a very kind of modern way of thinking, you know, it's a time where, you know, there's this wonderful relationship between North America and South America and tra artists traveling back and forth and capturing um, great ideas. Uh, and Gershwin, you know, brings in these Cuban elements and we've got bongos and maracas and guiros and, you know, Cuban sticks, all sorts of wonderful percussion. So it kind of sets the stage with high energy start, um, wonderful melo melodies, but it also is quite complex in the fact that it's kind of layering of these, these different lyrical m materials, which is in a way it sort of echoes what, what Daniel does, so this layering of, of constant um, bubbling of thoughts uh, within it. Um, it's just, you know, I've always loved Gershwin, so I'm sure many people like, like I do, but it's a, it's a fun, fun, high energy piece with some just truly beautiful moments in, in the middle where people get to sing and be reflective and thoughtful. Oh, that's fantastic. And I know you can just hear how Gershwin had spent some time there. Wasn't writing music about some, a place he hadn't been. He had definitely been and spent good time. And you can, you can hear that strongly coming through in this piece of music. Um, and then we jump to Prokofiev. Five. Right. <laughs> uh, the opposite end of the spectrum. Um, interestingly enough, it, it came quite a long time after the last symphonic or um, orchestral symphony that he wrote. Um, I, I believe it was 
There was a couple that were more based on, on theatrical works, um, but it was a good 20 years between um, the five and I think the two that he had written a symphonic piece. And it was a number of years after he had traveled, spent time in America and in France and Germany and had returned um, to spend the summer north of, of Moscow to write this piece, um, which is a, a wonderful and a huge and challenging work. So how did you choose that and tell us more about it? Well, you know, it's, it's, Bukov has always been a favorite of mine. Um, you know, Romeo and Juliet was a piece that I fell in love with as a teenager going to watch it with Royal Ballet. And, you know, this is, this is kind of the heart of Prokofiev, the music of Romeo and Juliet. And I feel that this piece captures it without all of that, um, symbolic romance, but it, it, it goes deeper. We, we all know that for, composers the five is always epic I mean you just look at Beethoven five and Tchaikovsky five and you know Schubert five and all, all of these pieces but and Mendelssohn they are this they're important uh pivotal works and I think for for Prokofiev in a way is probably the most loved of his symphonies everybody loves of course the classical but it, it's really not quite as Prokofiev as this one so I'd say you're deep in the heart of of understanding him when you when you listen to this piece and it's a commentary of of uh the soul of of man woman or humanity essentially um so it's a big epic work um we had all this percussion in the Cuban overture so you know, this book of your five, you know, it also has a very big percussion section. There's um, a lot of sort of references to uh, militaristic moments, but there's also very, very happy, happy moments. I, I think of um, the dance of Prokofiev's ballet music, and I hear, um, like, like Tchaikovsky, that Prokofiev's a composer that emulates dance music as well as the lyricism and the soulfulness. So it's a big four movement symphony of which the, the first and the third movements are very, um, very much um, songs of, of, of love in, in a way. And the second and the fourth movement are, uh, the second is a, a scherzo with this beautiful um, sort of plagal moments in it where, you, you know, you think a little bit of the, the marriage scene, but any, anyhow, it ends with this, um, what I like to say, get me to the church on time, you know, <laughs> bam, 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 bam. that's always the end of the second movement, and I can't get it out of my head, but, but that's just my personal uh, take with that, that that wonderful jazzy element that, that comes into this. And the fourth movement, I mean, I suppose jazzy is really good word for, for Prokofiev in this time. So that's in a way the linking of these two pieces um, on the cusp of, of, of break, Prokofiev really breaking out into modern dance music. Mm -hmm. um, it's really fun and um, epic. So um, I'd say that's, yeah. So happy to be doing this with Vermont Symphony. So oh, thank you for programming it. I can I can tell you our musicians are always uh, ready for challenge, um, always ready for that, and, um, and look forward to spending some time on this piece and for playing it for our audiences. I'd I'd love to go back a little bit more to you personally um, about other things that you've been involved with um, in the past and currently some initiatives that people might not be aware about aware of about you, uh, for example, Cascade Conducting. Tell us a little bit about what that is. Yeah, Cascade Conducting is a workshop that um, I'm the, I suppose, the founding artistic director of. It's for um, conductors and also most recently composers. Um, David Ludwig was our artistic um, teacher for the composers workshop for, for a couple of uh, seasons. Um, we're going to be continuing that. The, the, the important thing about Cascade is to try to bring diversity on the podium um, and also in support diverse composers. So we give a lot of scholarships and it's very international. Um, we have Latinx and African-American and women's, women's scholarship, just to name a few of them and really try to uh, create uh, a, a safe uh, network within the organization where people can learn at a high level, they can 
have access to Symphony Tacoma musicians, but also youth symphony musicians that join. And we come together once a year in the summer and, um, you know, have a have an incredible time together, learning intensely uh, over, you know, approximately seven days and sometimes online leading up to that as, as well for extra study sessions. And uh, one other thing I'd love to have you talk a bit about is you, um, you're you quite involved with commissioning, uh, conducting new world premieres, um, over 40 of them to date, I'm sure, as well as um, incorporating other elements in symphonic um, concerts, such as film, a bit of editing on your side. Talk to us a little bit about those two things, about commissioning and premiering commissions and other art forms that you incorporate into the performance of uh, symphonic music. Yes, absolutely. It's actually one of my uh, big, big passions is uh, crossover collaboration um, arts with music. So so um, I started when I was also uh, at Cincinnati Symphony working with the artist and composer conductor Tandon. Mm. And I traveled with him intensely um, from across Asia to Russia, um, America and, and in Europe and in a way he gave me just such a very different education in a way from from my my schooling from Oxford to to um, Curtis and Juilliard with Otto Werner Muller it, it, it really opened my eyes to the possibilities of making music in a very very different way so let's say, you know, using stone jugs or using paper or using the, the natural elements around us. Um, and then, of course, he was also a, an incredible film composer with Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon. So our projects came very much um, visual as well as, as um, um, you know, it was incredibly strong music live. But but when you see it visual, there, there's an, inc an added element there of of performance art that you cannot capture in recording. And so that kind of plunged me into the world of um, film. I was production coordinator for uh, one of the festivals at the Barbican with him. Uh, I've done everything from video editing to, to setting up stage sound um, for opera type productions, um, running surtitles, running uh, film footage, coordinating, collaborating, you know, even changing and editing things. So when COVID then happened, um, I, in fact, I've been doing that this for a while with my music director position in El Paso. Um, I started creating videos and films to go with music. So that started with um, doing some of Tandon's works, but then uh, commissioning my own. For example, Steve Reich, The Desert Music, we have a 50 minute film and I worked with a, the planets by host with not just the planets, but open it up to the whole universe and, and took some of those footage from NASA and worked with a film designer to edit and that and that went on. So I, I've done several big productions where we put visuals on. Um, yeah, so it's it's a passion of mine. I I did quite a lot of it during COVID and um, it was a it was a wonderful wonderful experience. It's a shame when you can't get there and do it in person. So, but this was very very satisfying and fulfilling. And I I learned I've got a number of projects um, on Symphony Tacoma's YouTube channel and and my YouTube channel um, that spotlight some of that um, arts collaborations. And one I have to tell you one of my favorite ones was was Fire. Fire Mountain, where we uh, captured footage, and it's about melting glaciers. Um, we captured the footage of the mountain, as well as um, glass artists with liquid glass pouring over the mountain. So this is this is like this imprint oh. on on Mount Rainier of of melting glass. You know, we are stoking the fire, and thus what is happening, the temperature of the planet warming and and just kind of a, a really a response um, that, that Daniel wrote and that was a, a wonderful collaboration with the Glass Museum and the Hilltop Glass Artists. So yeah, love love working in long-term projects with, with collaborative partners. It's really, really satisfying. So fulfilling. That's film and glass and music in one. Um, I don't know if you know that we'll have a, an, I'm going to get this a little bit wrong. I think it's April 2024. 
four, when the clips comes right over Burlington, we're right in the path. Um, so that's going to be an amazing, what, eight to 10 minute moment uh, in Burlington uh, that just feels like it needs and it will have some artistic responses to that. Well, before we go, um, anything about Vermont that you'd like to share or discover or wish people in Vermont knew about you? Give us a sort of a final thoughts about your Vermont connections. Um, well, I, I love the open minded of of the people of Vermont um, I love the fact that it feels sort of on the cusp of you know both brilliantly um, his historical place but but also really looking to the future so I think I think for me that really excites me about Vermont being ready to to do things differently to to look and, and see how how can we be better how can we be open to making this a better world and a better place. Um, you know, I suppose I share the love of cheese and uh, <laughs> uh, gorgeous outdoor um, skiing, if I can get back to it, and hiking. I'm a runner. Uh, and yeah, you know, I'm looking forward to going down the on the trails later later this week. So yeah, I I uh, I think Vermont's a lovely place to to be and to live. So I'm thrilled to be one of your um, one of your search director candidates for the music Great. director. Good. Well, we're so happy to have you here. Can't wait to see you at the Flynn on Saturday, the 17th of September. And thank you so much for joining me on the Zoom. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.